Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Lawrence Park Community Church. As you can see, I'm the only one in Lawrence Park Community Church right now. My name is Reverend Stephen Milton, and once again, we're in lockdown mode uh, for everybody's health and safety. Um, we hope this doesn't go on too much longer. Uh, hopefully mid-February, we can start having people back here. But for now, we're just playing it safe since the hospitals are still filling up and the ICUs are too. So welcome, welcome on this beautiful uh, snowy morning. It's so crisp and beautiful outside. Lots of little light white snow, nothing too terrible. I know Michael Larkin, our property manager is here and you may have seen on social media that it took Michael and Noel and Tim Bradshaw and Gordon to dig us out uh, when the big storm came this past week. So thank you to all of the boys of, snow, of uh, winter for doing that for us. Um, this church, even when you're not here, it is still getting used. There's two schools here, one in the basement and one um, up top, and they're both still open. Um, and of course, other people stop by, uh, particularly congregants, if you want to go to Sunnybrook or something, you can stop by and park here. So um, we, need our, we need our parking lot, so thank you guys for uh, getting us out. So today, uh, we're going to be concluding our uh, series of uh, sermons on Oscar movies. Um, we have talked about Dune, and we've talked about The Power of the Dog, and if you missed those, they're on our YouTube channel, and you can also find them on our website in the sermon section. Today, though, we're going to talk about Don't Look Up. Don't Look Up is a satire uh, starring Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence, among others, and um, I'll be talking about that during our sermon. And you'll see a trailer of the film in case you haven't actually seen it already. So, it's going to be a lot of fun talking about that movie. It's, it's caustic and satirical, um, and, uh, and of course it's about climate change, so it'll be interesting to talk about that. So for now, why don't we get ourselves ready for worship. Uh, parents, if you have children here who you would like to have go to Sunday school, I'll be doing a children's time, which they should stick around for, but if you want them to join Amy Sagar in her online Sunday school class, you're welcome to do so. She meets at 11 o'clock on a separate Zoom address, so just type into the chat, I'd like um, to go to Sunday school and Allison will give you the Zoom code. And if you would like to have closed captioning, uh, we have that as well. Just go to the bottom of your screen and click on the uh, CC button. So now, let's get ready for worship as we take, and let's do that by taking two deep breaths just to get ourselves centered. So get comfortable on your couch or chair, wherever you are. And one. And let it out. And another one and let it out. And now let's sing our first hymn. And when 
Friends, that spirit of gentleness that Michelle and Carrie were singing about, that spirit is everywhere. Perhaps this week when the snow was falling, you took a moment to go outside and notice that the world gets very quiet when it snows. I guess the snow absorbs the sound. There's a deep peace that underlies all things. It's like the choppiness of the water, but if you go deep, the water is still. It's that peace that you feel when a baby in your arms finally falls asleep and they have that look of utter trust as they look up at you. Or maybe it's the peace that you felt in a lover's arms. Or just the peace that you feel when you're sitting and seeing the sun go down and for a few moments it just seems like everything's right. That peace is what we Christians gather to try and uncover and nurture in ourselves and others. And so now I invite you to unmute yourselves and wish each other the peace of Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. So hi kids. Um, Today, I want to tell you about a really special man who died this week, just a couple days ago. He was someone who I really admired, so I want to tell you about him. His name was Thich Nhat Han, and here's a picture of him. He died at the age of 95, so he lived a good, long life. So it's not tragic that he died, but he will be missed because he was such a wonderful teacher to so many of us. Thich Nhat Hanh was from a country called Vietnam, which is in Asia, so a few countries away from China. And in the 1960s, he was a Buddhist monk. Buddhism is another religion where they spend a lot of time meditating and praying for peace. And in his country, the north and the south parts of the country were at war with each other. And he and other Buddhists didn't choose sides. They just said the fighting should stop. Killing each other won't solve any of our problems. And at that time, the southern part of the country was being helped by the United States, our neighbor to the south. And so Thich Nhat Hanh got on a plane and he came to America to talk to Americans about the value of peace. And he started teaching Americans about Buddhist ways of practicing peace, which included meditation. And he went back and forth between Vietnam and the United States a few times, and he taught at some of their big universities, like Columbia University. But then in 1966, the southern part of Vietnam, where he lived, said, we don't want you to come back anymore because you keep saying that war is wrong. So he got stuck. He couldn't go home. So where should he go? 
we decided to move to France. And in France, you know, he wasn't in the country that was waging war anymore. So it was like, well, what am I going to do? So he set up a meditation center, a monastery in France called Plum Village. And that's where, you know, it's amazing what can happen sometimes when you believe in peace. Because this man who'd been locked out of his own country, it seemed no one was going to listen to him. He started teaching people about how to do Buddhist meditation and Buddhist started teaching them about Buddhism. And he started writing books and he wrote a lot of books. And I read a bunch of those books and he taught me all sorts of wonderful things. And I want to teach you one of those things right now. Now, you know how we pray, right? We pray to Jesus and we pray to God and we, some, we clasp our hands together sometimes, or you just sit down on a chair, or you close your eyes and you pray to God. Well, the Buddhists have a different, slightly different way of praying. What they do is they sit down and they cross their legs and they get really quiet. And then they say um, a particular word in their head over and over again in time with their breath. And that calms them right down. And sometimes they just do prayers which are for their family and then their neighborhood and then their city and then their country and then the whole world and then all species and all planets and all galaxies. Like their prayers can be very expensive. And I've been praying in, in that way for a long time. And I can tell you, it really, really helps calm you down. The problem is, you know, it takes about 20 or 30 minutes and people usually do it at the beginning, beginning of the day before things get too busy. But, you know, you don't always have time to sit down and pray uh, and, and meditate like that, right? Sometimes you just can't find time to do it. And sometimes in the middle of your day, you'll get so upset about something. You know, maybe a kid said something mean to you at school or you got a paper back, you know, an assignment back from school that you didn't like or Maybe you're just having a bad day. Sometimes you're out and about and there's no place to sit down and meditate. And people think you're weird. So what should you do? Well, Thich Nhat Hanh taught a particular type of meditation that you can do anywhere you want, at any time. It's called walking meditation. So today I want to tell you about how that works. So for this, you need to be able to see me walk though. So, okay, so imagine, get my cord right here. Imagine you're walking along, okay? When you're walking, you breathe, right? You can't help but breathe when you walk. Pay attention to your breath for a minute. Just keep track. So you're breathing in and out. In and out. Now, as you breathe in and out, pay attention to your steps. One, two, three. That was on my in-breath. One, two, three on my out-breath. So I, pray, I, I take about three steps for every in-breath, and I take about three steps for every out-breath. And what Thich Nhat Hanh taught his followers to do is that when you're walking down the street to the store from school, you can meditate when you're walking. And the way you do it is as you walk, just, keep, just figure out how many steps you take on the in-breath and how many steps you take on the out-breath. Usually it's about the same. For grown-ups, it's often three or four steps. You'll have to figure out what works for you. But while you're doing it, this time, as you're walking, on the in-breath, say in for every step you take. So in, in, in. And then on the out-breath, when you breathe out, every time your foot hits the ground, say out. Out, out, out. And you just do that over and over again. In, in, in. Out, out, out. You don't have to say it out loud. You can just say it in your head. But what's interesting about this is that if you do it, you will find that you calm right down very, very quickly. Your mind stops thinking about all the things that are bugging you. And you just sort of enter into this calm state and you'll find that you notice things that you never noticed before. Even in a neighborhood street that you've walked down a thousand times, you'll notice things about the houses or maybe a bird on a branch or the beauty of the snow as it glistens on a car. All sorts of things just sort of pop out of the environment around you because you've silenced your chattering mind. You've given it some small thing to do just by saying in, 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 out, out, out. And you've aligned your mind with your body with the breath. That'll calm you down and make you more aware of what's going on around you. This can really help. On the days when things are going badly, this can really help you get some perspective, calm down, and after you've done it, once you get home, you may go, oh, you know, maybe they didn't mean to hurt my feelings when they said that. Or, 
They did hurt my feelings and they meant to say it, but I can let that go. More, maybe I should talk to them tomorrow and tell them they hurt my feelings. But when I do that, I don't have to feel weak and angry about it. I can just say, you know, you hurt my feelings yesterday when you said that. I wanted you to know that. You can do things calmly if you meditate and if you pray, which can make things go better than if you just do it out of reaction. Oh, they hurt me and I want to talk to them back. Try walking meditation. Thich Nhat Hanh has taught this to millions of people. And, you know, if even one person on this planet feels more peaceful, this whole planet has become a little more peaceful. So that's why I wanted to share today. And now we're going to hear a story from scripture that Stephanie Bowman's going to read for us. And it's about a day when Jesus walked into a uh, synagogue, which is the Jewish form of church, and he met some people who maybe should have been practicing walk walking meditation themselves because they got into a pretty bad mood. So let's hear what scripture has to say. The reading today is from Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 30. And there are two parts. The beginning of the Galilean ministry. Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. The rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his mouth. They said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, Doubtless you will quote to me this proverb, Doctor, cure yourself. And you will say, Do hear also in your hometown the things that we have heard you did at Capernaum. And he said, Truly, I tell you, no prophet is accepted in the prophet's hometown. But the truth is, there were many widows in Israel in the time of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three years and six months, and there was a severe famine over all the land. Yet Elijah was sent to none of them, except to a widow at Zarephath in Sidon. There were also many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. When they heard this, all in the synagogue were filled with rage. They got up, drove him out of the town, and led him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built, so that they might hurl him off the cliff. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. So as you just saw, um, uh, Don't Look Up is a modern satire, and it's also an allegory of our times. The plot's really simple. Two nerdy scientists, played by Jennifer Lawrence and Leonardo DiCaprio, discover a comet which is heading straight for Earth. When it arrives, it will wipe out civilization and probably most of Earth's species at the same time. So they take their discovery to the government, and the government just doesn't want to listen. And the president's Trump-like, played by Meryl Streep, who has a great time with the role. And in time, the White House does decide to act, but only because another scandal has made um, a Meryl Streep's character, the president, her ratings have fallen so low that she decides that maybe if she jumps on this comet thing, it'll help her chances at re-election. 
in time, the White House uh, goes down this path and Leonardo DiCaprio becomes the public face of this scientific discovery. They like him because he's cute. And it seems like the world will be saved in time. But then a media guru, a billionaire, intervenes and says, you know, there's a lot of really precious metals on that comet. And why don't we stop our current rescue mission and figure out another one where we could mine the comet before it gets close to Earth and then we'll break it apart so that it doesn't actually kill the Earth. Unfortunately, that venture fails and the Earth is destroyed. And don't look up, it's uh, the government and the corporations who are the major villains. And they just dupe a gullible public. The film is a thinly disguised allegory of climate change and the frustration which climate change scientists have experienced over the last few decades trying to con convince governments, the corporations, and the general public to wake up and realize what kind of trouble we're in. It's no surprise at the end that it's the old billionaires who are on the spaceship which takes off to find another inhabitable planet. The elite, including the media, the corporations and the government, are just too self-interested to care, to really care about the fate of the world. Critics haven't liked this movie. It's been panned thoroughly. Um, it got lousy scores on Rotten Tomatoes. And the critics have said that it's, it all feels too on the nose. It's too much of a, transpar a transparent allegory of climate change. Leading scientists, of course, have been saying that climate change is real for decades, and uh, corporations have responded by creating dummy public interest groups that claim that climate change is a lie. And governments have dragged their heels to do the right thing on climate change. Um, even just last year at COP26 in, in Glasgow, too few promises were made to cut emissions, and climate scientists say that this film, Don't Look Up, actually really captures their frustrations with governments, corporations, and the public really well. But you know, something funny happened on the way to making this movie, and that was, it was all ready to go into production. The script was written, the stars had been signed, the, ca the crew had been signed, everything was ready to roll, and then the first lockdown happened. <laughs> Don't Look Up actually was planning to shoot in March 2020, just as the lockdown came. And so they had to put off production for six months. And the director, Adam McKay, was really frustrated by this, of course. But a funny thing happened during that six months. He started getting texts and emails from his cast and crew saying, can you believe it? Like, the pandemic sounds like the movie we were about to shoot. There's a president who's saying you can cure COVID by, you, by injecting bleach. There's people who say that the virus doesn't even exist. There's other people who say vaccines would do more harm than good. And of course, once they started shooting, things got even weirder with an election showing that the Republicans have been defeated, but them saying, no, it's all a lie, that we won the election. So Adam McKay, during that six months, as he was watching the you know, bizarre, surreal things that have happened during this pandemic, changed the script. <laughs> he said he went back into the script and he rewrote it so it would become even more absurd. He says he added about 20% more absurdity in it because he was afraid that the real life had overtaken the satire that he was trying to write. One of the key themes in the film is that people in power are greedy, deceptive, and they don't take responsibility for their actions. In the film, people in power lie about everything. In one really lovely small scene, um, as the scientists are waiting in the White House hallway for their first meeting with the president, a general is sitting with them and he says, hey, do you want some snacks? And they say, yeah, sure. And he says, okay, that's 10 bucks for each snack. And they're kind of surprised by that. And he takes their money, pockets 50 bucks, and then he leaves because the president doesn't want to see them that day. And then the next day they find out the snacks at the White House are always free. <laughs> and it's this lovely little moment that Jennifer Lawrence's character keeps obsessing over. Why would he charge us for snacks? That shows that the veniality of greed can operate at all levels. It's worth it at 50 bucks and it's worth it at a billion. The public is uh, portrayed as gullible dupes who buy the idea that this mission to mine the comet will save the earth and provide much needed jobs. And when the mining mission backfires, 
the people responsible, the billionaire social media um, guru, as well as the president, just slink out of mission control. They pretend they have to go to the bathroom. And the president even leaves her son behind as she gets on a spaceship with the billionaire and other billionaires to go to another planet. The rich and powerful in this movie just want what they want, and they take no responsibility for their actions. It all seems terribly possible, just barely more ridiculous than life itself, the way things are going. And it poses the question, what would it take for us to take responsibility for a worldwide crisis like climate change? At what point do we agree to listen to the prophets, no matter how dire their predictions, and act on them? What does that take? In our scripture reading today, Jesus appears in his hometown of Nazareth to read scripture in the synagogue. And he declares that he is the fulfillment of an ancient prophecy. His reading and his declaration surprised the locals. They say, hey, isn't this Joseph's boy? We saw this guy grow up. We know who you are. And now you say you're some kind of prophet? You're the Messiah even? But before they can say anything more, Jesus intervenes and he says, you're probably going to want me to do some healing miracles for you, like I did in some of the other towns. But the fact is, I will remind you that other prophets, like Elijah and Elisha, when they did miracles, healing miracles, they didn't do it in their hometown. They did it for people far away. They refused to help their hometown folks. Well, when the people in the synagogue hear this, they're enraged. Jesus is snubbing them, and they get so angry that they try to run him off a cliff to kill him. So what's going on here? You know, Jesus has the gift of being able to read the room, right? Better than most. He knows these people. He's grown up with these people. He knows what's on their minds. And he's correctly surmised that they have some doubts about whether he's a Messiah or a prophet, but they do know that they would like him to heal their sick, just like he's done in other towns. They want the good stuff, what's good for them, without dealing with the full consequences of the Messiah's message. And Jesus, when he says, those other prophets didn't cure their hometowns, he's suggesting that you people have some stuff to work on, stuff that you need to acknowledge before I'm going to help you. But not one of them stands up and says, what are you talking about? Yeah, we may have made some mistakes, but we don't know what, why you're holding back. None of them even suspect that they might have done something wrong. Instead, they just assume that he's snubbing them for no reason. So they get up and they run him off a cliff. They try to run him off a cliff. Like us, they don't want to talk about the things they may have done wrong. Issues like climate change and our role and bringing it about, they'd rather shoot the messenger and run him out of town. So why are we talking about climate change in church? Right? Surely it's a government policy issue, it's a scientific issue. And it is all of those, of course. But it's also an issue which affects all of us. Scientists, scientists estimate that over the last 40 years, half of all animals alive on Earth have died because of our lifestyle. Half of all the animals on the world in the world. They've died because habitats have been destroyed. They've died because the oceans have been poisoned with our chemicals. They've died because they've been overhunted. And scientists now predict that by 2050, half of all the remaining species could go extinct. It's possible that this whole interconnected system of bugs and soil and sky and water and rivers, all of that could actually collapse stop working and imperil all of us, all species, including us, with massive crop failures and terrible extreme weather events. We're in real trouble. So how do we react to this? We've been hearing about it for a long time, right? Al Gore gave us the same message 20 years ago with his Inconvenient Truth, which won an Academy Award. It's not like it was a secret. David Suzuki in Canada has been warning us for decades on the nature of things and after that. 
you know, like the, the message has been out there. Our modern prophets have been telling us over and over again what's coming. But we've known, but we haven't wanted to face it. And you know, there's many ways of reacting when you're faced with a sin this enormous, right? One is to simply deny it. Just say, no, you're wrong. Climate change isn't caused by human beings. You know, this is, these are just natural variations. It's got nothing to do with us. That's one approach, and obviously there are people who have done that, and the fossil fuel companies have funded people to say that kind of thing and to deny that carbon has anything to do with what we're watching. Fortunately, increasingly, lately, more people are saying, okay, I get it, the scientists must be right. I mean, there's just too many of them now saying it. But since it's all so overwhelming, we refuse to let it sink in. We want to have happy lives, so we agree to do a little bit. You know, we agree, okay, phase in some carbon taxes. That probably won't wreck my life. I'll do my recycling. You know, I'll do some small things. And I know all sorts of us are doing small things here and there, but the scientists keep screaming, it's not enough, it's not enough. And, you know, we're really waiting, we're really just sitting on our hands saying, I'll change a lot when someone forces me to, but I don't really want to yet. That attitude, which I think most of us have, is exactly what the movie is criticizing. We want to change a little, but not really enough to fix the problem. But the scientists are saying, no, you got to knock the comet off course. You have to change, you have to change the whole thing. You can't just nudge it a little bit. It's still going to hit you. Our current approach to this is not fixing it enough. So that's very much like just not looking up. In the movie, the Trump-like government that Meryl Streep leads, leads this huge campaign telling people, don't look up. Don't even look up to see what the trouble that's coming, which you can see in the night sky as the comet appears. We prefer to act as though this is someone else's problem to solve. You know, unless big com countries like China get on board, there's not much we can do anyway. It's a form of moral denial. We may be guilty, but we refuse to face the scale of what we've done. Now, there is another possibility, and some people get there. They listen to the evidence, and they become convinced that this is true, and that even me, in my little action in my lifestyle, I have helped cause this situation where half of the animals have died. I didn't do it all by myself, but I've been part of it. and they accept responsibility. But what can happen then is that it just becomes debilitating. It's so overwhelming, so huge. This isn't like hitting a deer on the car. This is like hitting a deer on the car and causing all the deers and all the owls and all the bears to go extinct, right? It's huge. It's so huge that if you take it really seriously, you won't be able to get out of bed in the morning. And so, it's so big that our sense of morality gets short-circuited. We can't handle it. And yet that's what a truly moral response to the crisis would look like. I suspect that all of us know this. And this is why we don't want to deal with this issue, because we're afraid that it'll just completely paralyze us. And yet logically, it's only when we connect the dots between our actions and the result that we can hope to get anything done to fix this problem. In today's scripture reading, Jesus denounces the people of Nazareth, saying that he won't heal them. No one stands up to ask why. They take no responsibility. They're not even curious about why he might object. They just get angry and they drive him out of town. And the text tells us that they want to throw him off a cliff. They want to kill him by throwing him off a cliff. They would rather kill the messenger than investigate their own sins. The choice of the cliff is significant. In ancient Israel, they celebrated Yom Kippur differently than they do now. Yom Kippur is the um, time of year when all of the Jewish people 
bring forward their sins and ask for forgiveness for the sins which they have, con they have committed over the last year. Back in first century Israel, when Jesus lived, the way they did that was people would get together in the temple, they would make sacrifices, they would talk about their sins and ask for forgiveness. And then the priests would ritually cast those sins into a goat. And there were actually two goats. And one of the goats, the one that received all the sins, would be taken to a cliff and thrown off a cliff to its death. They did this so that they could take the sins back to Satan, who was believed to live in, in the desert. But they threw the goat off of the cliff to expatiate themselves of their sins. This is the origin of the word scapegoat. Okay, when we scapegoat someone, we're remembering this ancient practice. In today's scripture passage, the people of Nazareth treat Jesus like a scapegoat because they want to throw him off a cliff to, their de to his death, but they don't want to do the critical previous step of repenting of their sins. But there's good news in this strange story, and that's that Jesus escapes. He isn't ready to die yet. He has too much to do. This, is, this happens right at the beginning of his ministry. He needs a couple of years to go through the countryside to teach people about the ways of love and compassion. And during that time, he will be warning his disciples that prophecy says that he, the Son of Man, will be captured by the authorities, crucified, and then resurrected. And he says he is willing to go through that for everyone else. It's critical that he establishes that he's willing to do it on his own, voluntarily, rather than just being crabbed by the, the crowd at Nazareth. He needs people to understand this is voluntary, that he is willing to get up on the cross. As God in human form, he agrees to be killed by humanity to absorb all of our sins, to be a human scapegoat for everyone who has ever lived. He does this so we can be forgiven. You remember on the cross, he says, forgive them for they know not what they do. Jesus allows himself, the God man, to be killed as a gift to all of us. When we have sinned and we recognize our responsibility, he looks down from the cross and says, I forgive you. The universe forgives you. Now get on with your life and follow me. Let's fix this. You can realize the full weight of your mistakes and not be paralyzed by them. But you need God to take, get you off the hook. Jesus takes that weight for us and gives us a way forward beyond the crushing guilt that would come with moral integrity when we face problems that are this big. That's why we need, we need to talk about climate change in church. Because we're taught that we do have an option to take full responsibility for what we've done and still have a good life. We don't need to deny the crisis or be debilitated by it. There's another middle way where we take responsibility and we can act because we know that we're forgiven but forgiven so that we can act in accordance with God's will, which is to save this beautiful planet. God created such wonders all around us. We can see them. We can feel them. God wants us to protect that. And even though we've done so much to try to destroy it, we are forgiven and invited to fix this. This is one of the greatest gifts of the spiritual life. It offers a path to mature action. It offers a way to accept responsibility and work for the common good, in contrast to the billionaires and presidents in the movie who slink away when they see that their solutions haven't worked. We don't have to figure out plan B of a spaceship to go to another planet. We can just stay and say, okay, we messed up, let's try again. Our faith, which seems so unrealistic in this story about a man who was crucified and resurrected, 
provides the means for adults to move past sins to make their lives and the life of the world better. We can take up the cross of climate change and walk with it rather than trying to deny it or throw it off the nearest cliff. We can dare to look up without fear. We can look up with courage and vision and decide that we're willing to be part of the solution. We can look up to God and say, okay, how can I help? And that's a blessing, not just to us, but to the whole world. Amen. And now I would like to invite you to say the version of the Lord's Prayer with me. The words will be on the screen. Let us pray. Loving God, through the Spirit's revelation, may your true nature be honored everywhere. May your reign of love come. May desire of your heart for the world be done in us, by us, and through us in the power of the Spirit. Give us the bread we need for each day. Forgive us. Enable us to forgive others. Keep us from all anxiety and fear. For you reign in the power that comes from love, which is your glory forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. God, creator of worlds, architect of galaxies, animator of stellar fires, origin of every living breath, we give thanks for the wonders of this world. Even on the coldest days, this world sparkles with beauty. Heaps of white snow delight the eyes of children and adults alike. Sudden snowfall provides an opportunity to renew our faith in each other. Strangers who dig out cars that get stuck. Neighbors who clear each other's walks without being asked. Your snow becomes an opportunity for compassion to sparkle in public. Thank you for the gift and beauty of this snow and the reminder that we can be good to each other at a moment's notice. God of compassion, we are devastated when we hear that a family has frozen to death crossing the U.S. border to reach our country. We pray for all people who have taken extreme risks to find safety in distant nations. For refugees who dare seas and channels, deserts and frozen fields to reach freedom. We pray for people persecuted for their faith, for their sexuality, for their language and culture. Help the richer nations of the world find homes for them and help us create a world where no one needs to flee their home country in fear. God of forgiveness, we ask for your compassion on us for the mistakes that we have made, for the ones we know that keep us up at night, for mistakes we make in ignorance or negligence. In both cases, damages are real, people and other species are hurt. Help us to see our mistakes so we can ask forgiveness and then we pray, restore us. Help us to be better people who stare up at the ceiling in bed remembering the good things which have happened this day. Help us replace misgiving with gratitude. In the name of the one who forgave all from the cross, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Um, first thing, uh, so we've got various announcements today, and the first thing I want to announce is that our scripture reader today, Stephanie Bowman, um, is going to be running for the Ontario Liberal Party uh, as the candidate for Don Valley West. There's an election coming up in June, and she is running for Kathleen Wynne's seat. Uh, Kathleen is stepping down and I know has been helping Stephanie. So as a church, we can't take a position, but we did want you to know that one of our congregants has decided to really try to help the community, and we congratulate her on that. So congratulations, Stephanie, and good luck. Thank you, Stephen. Our regular schedule this Monday um, is everything is on this week as usual, Monday meditation with Marilyn and coffee time with Allison on Tuesday at 1030. Um, I continue to lead a prayer service Wednesday at 3. And uh, hymn sing is again on at 3 o'clock with Paul Winkelmans. And uh, Laura Lane starts a Tai Chi stretch at uh, 2.30. So it's a good way to sort of limber up if you've been sitting too much in front of a computer or sitting around too much at in the house. Um, and this week's choice of song, sorry, for hymn sing will uh, have come from Diana Bukima. So this coming uh, Wednesday on January 26th at 7.30, I'm going to be giving the second uh, session of the Beatitudes, a Bible for Busy People. This is the same one as the one which I offered at 10 o'clock on, on, on Friday morning, which was a fascinating talk. We had about 17 people come out um, from a couple of congregations, most of whom came from Lawrence Park. So you don't have to do any preparation for these, um, but if you've ever wondered what those, how could Jesus say that the meek will inherit the earth? That doesn't seem to be what's happening. We will talk about that in detail and get into some of the hidden uh, levels of meaning that are in the Beatitudes. So that's at 7.30 on Wednesday night. 
Um, also, I um, would like to uh, hold confirmation classes for the teenagers of this congregation. And um, the parents have said, okay, but we want to talk about it first, since obviously confirmation in our day and age is not exactly the same as it was perhaps when you were confirmed. The kids need to have space to express doubts as well as just learn what they're supposed to believe. And I really believe that spirituality works when you understand what you're saying rather than just signing up for something because those are the words on the wall. So um, I would like to talk to parents first before we um, start talking to the children about this. So if you would like to be part of that Zoom call, which we will schedule for parents, uh, please send me an email. And grandparents, if you have uh, kids in their, if you have grandchildren in their, in their teens, uh, please talk to their parents and see if they might be interested in this. Just to give you a sense of where I'm going with this, um, one of the things which I think is really important now is people enter university and they don't really understand much about the Bible, and that actually holds them back from understanding Western literature and um, Western culture in general. And so I hope in our confirmation classes to raise the Christian literacy of our teenagers so that they'll actually do better in university. So please drop me a line if um, you would like to be part of that Zoom conversation. And once I get a few more emails back, we'll set a date and we'll let, we'll let you know what time we've decided on. And now um, we're gonna do something a little bit different. Um, as you know, there's a North Toronto Cluster uh, Green Committee which meets periodically. They um, discussed a movie last week. And um, at one of their previous meetings, uh, we were talking about, you know, geez, climate change and how do we fix this? It all seems so overwhelming. Well, when a trip's really big, it's easier if you just start taking a few small steps. So uh, for those of you who have been coming to church for a long time, you may remember the United Church used to have a minute for mission right, where uh, someone would get up and just give a little talk about what was happening with some of the mission and service funds. We thought it'd be interesting if we started a green minute, which uh, would happen every month or so, uh, where uh, someone today, Joyce Taylor, um, gives a little bit of explanation about positive things that can happen that can help us turn this situation around. So I'm now going to cede the floor to Joyce. Take it away, Joyce. Good morning, everyone. This is the first in a series of Green Minutes, ideas and developments that are helping to combat climate change and improve our environment. So this morning, I'm gonna be talking about an area of transportation that is becoming electric, but which you may not have heard about yet. We've all heard of electric trains and electric automobiles, but have you heard of an electric commercial aircraft? Well, there is a Canadian commercial passenger airline flying 500,000 passengers annually that's aiming to have the world's first certified, battery-operated, fully electric commercial aircraft operating with passengers later this year. Harbour Air, based in southern BC and North America's largest seaplane airline, in coordination with Transport Canada and the US Federal Aviation Administration, have successfully tested their first e-plane and are now applying for regulatory approval. They have replaced the original motor in a de Havilland DHC2 Beaver with an all-electric motor running on a lithium-ion battery. Since this motor has no gearbox and few moving parts, there's a lot less need for maintenance, there are no emissions, and the only noise comes from the propeller. Everything is progressing so well, they've just announced that they're working on their second e-plane, another de Havilland Beaver. So while Harbour Air is already carbon neutral and have been since 2017, over the next few years, they are aiming to become the first electric commercial airline. So the next time you're in downtown Vancouver or downtown Victoria, you may just see an electric plane skimming the water. And who knows? Maybe they'll be coming to Toronto's harbor too sometime. Thank you, Joyce. That's fascinating. Who knew? 
and jet planes just spew out a ton of uh, carbon with their jet fuel. It's a very dirty way to get around. So that's really great news that there may be an alternative to that. So um, just looking at a little bit ahead, this coming Sunday, uh, we are going to have a, a guest preacher. Jennifer Henry is going to be our preacher. Jennifer um, has a, a really interesting background. She's, um, she was the head of Kairos, which is the interdenominational uh, social justice uh, organization. She was the, their head for many years. And lately, she's been working for the United Church's national office in developing the new mission statement for the United Church of Canada. And that's what she's going to talk about um, in her sermon next week. Um, she's a really, really interesting person. I encourage you to come and hear what the United Church is up to and also to stick around and ask her questions. Um, she's a fascinating person with a lot of really, really interesting experience. So that's next week. Um, uh, for our sermon, I'll be presiding, but um, she'll be doing the sermon. And if you would like to provide some funds so this wonderful church can keep going, we are always very happy to receive uh, donations. You can do it. We can't pass around a, a collection plate the way we used to. So please, uh, after the service, maybe you'll consider sending us um, some money if you're not already a regular donor. You can use electronic banking to send money to this address. And if you want to sign up to become a regular donor and just have money deducted from your bank account every month, you can talk to Michael, Lauren, uh, Michael, Michael uh, Larkin at this address uh, at the bottom of the screen. And finally, if you want to talk to me, um, I love talking to congregants, so just uh, drop me an email and we'll figure out a time when we can speak. Um, if you've been coming forever or you've just started coming uh, or somewhere in between, I am always game to talk. So just uh, drop me an email. And I'm not in the office much right now just because of lockdown conditions. So if you call the office, I may not get your phone message until next Sunday. So it's better to send me an email first. So those are all of our announcements. Um, and now we're going to sing our final hymn, Comfort, Comfort Now My People. So friends, go now into the world with kind and daring hearts. Go in peace, knowing that whatever you've done, it can be forgiven. 
the weight can be taken off your shoulders. And you can live a thriving life to help yourself and to help others. And with that knowledge, go forth, bring peace, bring compassion, bring kindness to this world. May the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Each